Hi, everyone, and welcome to the special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and the Strategic Wealth Strategies All-Star Podcast. Alan, how are you? I know you're excited about our guest, aren't you, Alan? Yes, I am. Tony, it's uh, great talking to you today. Yes, we have Tony Curran on. Hey. We're going to talk about Mary and George hey. on Stars. Tony, it's got to feel great uh, to be in another great project and seeing all the things that are happening in the industry as everything's starting to pick back up, right? Yes. No, it's, it's interesting. When I finished um, a shooting Mary and George in June last year, I was, uh, I was on the picket line in Los Angeles with, uh, with my old pal Brian Cranston and, and uh, many other friends. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was nice that they try to work something out with regards to the, to the strike. And um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm back shooting the prequel to Outlander and another show called Lockerbie right now. And obviously, yeah, it's great to be promoting Mary and George. Excited to see what everybody thinks about it, yeah. Go ahead, Alan. What's your first question? Well, Tony, tell us about Mary and George and your character. Yeah, well, Alan, I play uh, I play King James the Sixth of Scotland, uh, the first of England. He was Mary Queen of Scots' uh, son, and um, uh, the, the story is based on a book called uh, The King's Assassin by a man called Benjamin Woolley, and um, that was translated and adapted for a screen for our seven episodes, Mary and George, um, by a man called D.C. Moore, <clears throat> David, and it's basically about. Um, Mary and George Villiers, um, the Julianne Moore and Nick Galatine play, and uh, how she had no autonomy, she had no money, no currency. A woman at that time, Jacobean history, you know, she didn't have any power whatsoever. She uses her son. He's very handsome. He's very well. She sends him to France to get well-versed in languages and fencing and the ways of the world. He comes back quite mature, and basically she puts him into King James's court. Um, uh, King James is a uh, famously, uh, you know, he had favorites, young men, and he basically seduces King James and uh, Mary and George Villiers rise up through the, uh, through the, uh, they had this incredible ascension through, through, through the royal court of King James. Um, King James, Mary Villiers, and George Villiers are all buried in Westminster Abbey. So, um, so she, they both did okay. You know, you know, they both did all right. Yeah. Have you had a role like this before playing in royalty? I know you've done so many different things. Yeah, I mean, there was a, a, a project I, I did um, uh, years ago called uh, Pillars of the Earth. Uh, that was with Eddie Redmayne, Rufus Sewell. Um, uh, yeah, I played a king in that, actually. But <clears throat> to be honest, <clears throat> I, I've never had a role quite like this. It's... it's, it's um, uh, I think it encapsulates, uh, you know, all of humanity. King James, he's a very, he's a very uh, hedonistic king, uh, pleasure seeking. He's 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 vulnerable. He's 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 strong. He's uh, it, it, there's so many elements to the man that, um, uh, that I found so compelling to play that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just fascinated to see what people think about it because he's, a, you know, this Jamestown, Virginia was the first British colony and the Americas named after King James, uh, the King James Bible, and so of many other elements of, um, of his life, which um, is sort of a very little known about it. People don't know much about that 22-year period, that Jacobean period from 1603 to 1625, which King James was king of, of the British Isles. Um, so, um, yeah, it was a real challenge. It was definitely a, arguably one of the most uh, challenging roles I've, I've ever had. Um, but uh, but um, I, in, in many ways, also, it was the most fulfilling role I've ever played, you know. So I hope, um, I hope people get to see it and um, see what, uh, like to see what they think of it all, yeah. Well, Tony, uh, tell me, how, how did you prepare for your character? Well, yeah, I was um, a lot of my uh, prep. Um, I read a lot about King James, about the Billios. I read the novel King's Assassin, but a lot of it was um, the, the, the the novelist Benjamin Woolley. I spoke to him about Mary and George. I spoke to him about King James, and uh, for hours on end, I would question him because Benjamin Woolley's like an encyclopedia Britannica. 
you know, of, of British and global world history. And I would ask him about <coughs> King James' um, fundamental questions. I was like, what made this guy tick? What was it? <coughs> and we came, he showed me photographs, paintings of King James. And like a, like a teacher, I was his pupil in many ways. He would say, look at that photograph, look at King James. What do you think he's thinking right now? And I'm like, okay, there's a, that's a question. And I, I'd see him sitting on the throne with his scepter and his, um, his orb, and I'd be like, he, he, he looks like he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, exactly. There's, you know, yeah. I mean, my, my father, Lord Darnley, and back in Scotland before I became King of England, Lord Darnley was assassinated. He was blown up. My father, Mary Queen of Scots, was taken from Scotland by Queen Elizabeth. She was imprisoned by Queen Elizabeth, and then eventually... Um, she was executed, decapitated by Queen Elizabeth. I was kidnapped. King James was kidnapped when he was 12 years old for a year at a place called the Ruffin Castle. Um, and the term that I took from talking to Benjamin Woolley uh, that helped me with the character was, um, was King James was a man who was nourished in fear. So basically, the trauma that he suffered throughout his whole life, people had blown up his father, executed his mother, Try to kidnap him, try to kill him. So, you know, some people say paranoia will destroy you. But <laughs> I think I, I think King James is, um, you know, um, self awareness, self care, paranoia, I'll call it what you like, was justified in many ways because, you know, there's the old adage, you know, heavy sleeps the head that wears the crown. And I think within King James's um, makeup, um, a lot of the trauma that he experienced as a child, I think within any, you know, within humanity, if, if, if you have that much um, danger and trauma in your life, it can, only, it can only affect you in many ways. And I think um, a lot of, you know, hopefully the way I try to portray King James was, um, was because of what happened to him in the past and his, uh, his vulnerabilities, his strengths, um, and also his, uh, his love affairs he had with uh, these real men, Esme Stewart, Lord Lennox, Robert Carr, and, of course, this, um, this uh, relationship he had with George Villiers. So, um, yeah, he's quite a complex and maybe underappreciated king uh, yeah. to the right of the, uh, David, David D.C. Moore. And I'm like, why is that? And he was like, well, one, you know, maybe there's a lot of anti-Scottish sentiment from the English can you imagine at the time bringing a Scottish king and putting him on an English throne? People were like, you know, <clears throat> it was quite a contentious decision. They tried to blow him up in 1605. It was the gunpowder plot. He was also queer, and he was also an anti-warring king. Obviously, <clears throat> anybody will tell you, you go to war in any society, culture, it's kind of good for business. King James didn't want to do that. He called him Rex Pacificus, which in Latin means great king of peace. And basically, for 22 years, the, he brokered peace with France and Spain. So he was queer, he was Scottish, and he didn't <laughs> want to go to war. So many people oh, say that, that, that that's a hell of a that's a hell of a triumvirate, you know. Yeah, so many, it's a... many people say that's why that's why you don't hear much about the Jacobean period because uh, you know history is written by the victors, as it were, or the white man, and maybe it's been sort of pushed push to the side but maybe the, the viewers can decide that when they see the show i guess you know absolutely so Mar again mary and george premiering on stars april 5th again opposite julianne moore that's got to be an unbelievable another amazing person that you have on your list of who you've worked with and when you agree tony of all these great actors yeah no, she's incredible oh my god it was such a joy working with nick and julianne she brings so much, such a such a lightness to set Obviously, you know, as a as, you know, as a, a founding member of the Ginger Freedom Front, my friend, I'm uh, the more redheads on set, the better, right? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she's also a fellow Sagittarius. She's a, she's a redhead. Her mother's actually from Greenock, which I found out, uh, which is a little town outside uh, outside Glasgow, where I'm from. Um, so there's a bit of Celtic uh, connection there as well. No, she was she was such a joy. Um, what what a what an incredible actress for her line of work. You know, um, the Big Lebowski, still Alice, um, some of the oh, yeah. incredible projects she's working on. And working with her, she's 
such a professional and, and she brings such a lightness to set. But when the cameras roll as Mary Villiers, you better look out because she's coming for you, you know. She's, uh, totally. Her character is uncomp- uncompromising and uh, she will do whatever it takes to get what she wants. And, and historically, that's what Mary Villiers did in a world of men. She had this incredible um, uh, canniness, wisdom, and um, fortitude to actually work her way up through King King James' court. You know, subsequently she became the Duchess of Buckingham. All right, all right, awesome, awesome. Again, Mary and George premiering on Stars April fifth. Thanks again, Tony. Uh, That was special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show, and. It's a strategic wealth strategy celebrity podcast, guys. Take care.